This week on Previous World Weekly, Berserker gets a Netflix deal. We discuss who won the weekend between Zack Snyder's Justice League and Falcon and Winter Soldier. And we talk to the directors behind the Mike Manola documentary. It's all happening right now on Previous World Weekly. What's up, Previews World? It's Wednesday. It's New Comic Book Day, which means it's time for Previews World Weekly. I'm one of your hosts, Troy Jeffrey Allen. I'm your other host, Dashon Greenwood, a.k.a. the Duchess of Free Comic Book Day. Guys, last week we announced the Free Comic Book Day titles. Yeah. If somehow you managed to miss that, you can head to our social medias at Free Comic Book Day or FreeComicBookDay.com. Check out the list, 50 titles. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, yes. And I want to keep uh, reminding people, and just in case, like you will forget in the future or whatever reason, there's a real simple, easy way to keep on top of these things. Like, follow, and subscribe. Because mm -hmm. believe me, Free Comic Book Day and Previews World will be reminding you all the way through up until August, or I'm almost halfway through August, too. So definitely keep an eye on that. Um, Ashton, sure. uh, I need a second to gloat. Uh, you know, I can't even say if it's gloating, but I just want to present some evidence here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I, should, I shouldn't even told you that this was going to happen on the show because I should have ambushed you with this but look I, I read JLA Avengers this past weekend right I was feeling a little weepy a little nostalgic right I wanted some old school comic book fun and uh, Johnny can you throw up one of these panels for us so there's been an ongoing debate between Ash and myself and actually a former co-worker of ours named Carrie about magic and how it affects superman and if that means that superman can actually uh beat thor right mm -hmm. am i am i am i representing your opinion correctly am i representing the argument correctly here ashton you're representing the argument correctly I'll okay <laughs> <laughs> okay so i just i just johnny if you just throw that back up on screen real quick i just want to point out something in the right hand corner in the mm. panel, never mind that Superman can't lift the hammer. That's a whole nother can of worms. But in the right-hand corner, Thor specifically says there is an enchantment upon my hammer laid by my father Odin, right? Now, see, the argument was between you and I that mm -hmm. the hammer is not magic and Thor doesn't have to, is not necessarily magic, right? Correct. But what's an enchantment, Ashton? An enchantment, you know, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> Interpretations vary. Depends on the dictionary you consult. Uh -huh. Some may consider it magic. However, uh -huh. Uh -huh. I would like to point out that Superman has has wielded Mjolnir. It has happened. There, there's an image that came up the first time we talked about this, and I'm going to yeah. find it. It's from of this him book. Him holding Mjolnir and Captain America's shield. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, look, it's Whatever from this, this enchantment is, is obviously not, not <laughs> magical enough to hurt Superman. So the explanation they give in JLA Avengers, the image that you're talking about is actually from this book. And like the explanation okay. they give is that, and it's kind of a BS answer, right? But the explanation they give is like, Odin saw that the entire universe was in trouble. It was like, okay, let Superman lift the hammer real quick to like knock this this situation out real quick. And then we go back to like <laughs> him not being worthy. I mean, that's the explanation they give back in the book. It's kind of a BS answer, right? But I just want to point out Thor is magic and Thor's hammer is magic. And therefore, if Superman is susceptible to magic, I'm just saying. So what, what is what, that he could even beat Superman? Superman didn't, didn't seem particularly defeated. I mean, I'm just saying that there's a strong possibility that Thor can beat Superman. Because you guys were saying it's going to be a blowout. You were like, Superman, no way. In no way is, I'm sorry, no way is Thor going to beat Superman. And I'm saying that there's a chance that Thor okay. could beat Superman. That's I did saying. walk that back at one point and say that it wouldn't be a blowout. However, mm -hmm. Superman would still win. Okay. All right. So I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just Providing evidence for this argument that's gone on way mm -hmm. too long. It's almost been two years. Uh oh, Ford. I'm going to say Ford Air. Air. Ford Air. Air um, maybe Air. he's weak to magic used against him, but not magic okay. in its existence. Oh, I like that. Okay. All right. No, don't, don't, don't co-sign that just because it supports your theory. Whatever. Do you know what? No. Okay. I'm about to. I will. I'm going to go through the previews world videos. I know Johnny's telling us we have to move on. So I'm going to keep it quick. There is a particular <laughs> video from when we were still in the studio, so like beginning of last year, where mm -hmm. I said that just saying that Superman is 
you know, weak against magic, you can use magic against him. It doesn't, it's not just, I said that magic doesn't just exist and then Superman is defeated. You need to do magic to him. You can't just be like, boom, I'm here with the magic and then Superman dies. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, possibly. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. But Johnny is telling us to move on. I do want to know, however, what did Superman do exactly to make him not worthy to lift a hammer? Like, that's the question that's that this true. book does not answer. And I'm like, I, now I'm very curious about that. After I read that, I was like, oh, for my, my initial thought was like, ha, I'm right. And my second thought was like, wait a minute. <laughs> What does Superman do to make him not worthy? But anyway, uh, so, hey, guys, we have some special guests coming on this week. And uh, first, I want to show you something that they're responsible for. So there's a new Kickstarter out for this documentary called uh, Mike Magnola uh, Drawing Monsters. And so we're going to show you a trailer for that. And when we come back, we'll introduce you to the documentarians behind it who will be joining us for the whole show. Check it out. I think everyone young and old should check out Mike Mignola's work. It's brilliant. It's so good. At the very beginning of my comics career, being asked who I wanted to work with and asking for Mike. He's absolutely a genius. I need my Hellboy fix. I need to go to this world and spend some time there. Mike is, is absolutely important to the world of comic books. Mike was unique and original. Hellboy is probably the major creation of any comic book character through that time. I've been buying every BPRD Hellboy comic I could. The Marvel Universe, the DC Universe, I think with Mignola, it's a whole different kind of storytelling. What Hellboy does is perpendicular to that. Mike represents the side of comic books that is darker, more quirky. It's about using comics as a medium to redefine what comics can be. So it's so inspiring. You look at Mike and there's not a line wasted. He is such an astonishing artist. I myself have, have easily tried to imitate certain parts, but nobody can do what he does. We can all just learn from it. And it's coming soon there, but the Kickstarter is running right now on Kickstarter, and you guys can fully fund it, although it's actually been fully funded. So the good news is you can just get in, get in on the game late and join in. But first, I want to introduce you to the people behind this documentary, two of the creators, uh, Jim Dimonakos. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> okay. And Kevin Conrad Hanna. Great hey, Nice to meet you. And I'm, let me get this right. Jim, you are the director, and Kevin, you are the art director, right? Is that the deal here? No. Or did I get that we, back? No, actually, actually we're, we're both both. We, we're uh, both direct. Okay. Yeah, we're both directing, we're both art directing, and both producing. All right, cool, cool. That's a lot of hats, but that's actually pretty awesome. And the documentary actually looks cool already, so really cool. I already, I already threw my money at it. I think it's awesome. Um, you know, Magnola is an institution for sure. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be really cool to see how you guys introduce this, uh, you know, the Magnola verse to people through this documentary. I think it's actually really awesome. Um, we're definitely going to ask you guys some questions about it later. But first, there's a question I ask all our guests. It's kind of like an origin story for everybody. I'm going to let you go first, Kevin, and then I'm going to go to you, Jim. How did you guys get into comics? Oh, so in fourth grade, uh, I, fifth grade, I just discovered girls uh, in the form of the young lady <laughs> who was sitting next to me. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out any way to get her to notice me. And one day she brings in ElfQuest. Oh. And, and I was like, oh, you like ElfQuest? She was like, I love it. And I said, I have every single issue. And she goes, that's amazing. Can I see them? And I said, I'll bring them in. And then I went out that night and I bought every single issue. <laughs> and uh, uh, not with, with that girl anymore, but still with those comments. So. Okay. All right. That's actually the opposite of normally how that works. It's normally the, you know, you, the origin story usually goes, girls, I'm kicking the comics aside and I'm moving on. So it's nice to, that you mix it up a little bit. Uh, what about you, Jim? What, uh, what's your origin story with comics? Uh, so I would say when I was really young, so my I'm Greek. My parents would um, every few years send my brother and me to Greece for the summer. So we would spend our summer in Greece with our family over there. And <clears throat> over there, we also 
started picking up. They used to do uh, Greek editions of Spider-Man and um, like at that time they were just reprinting some of the Romita um, run of Spider-Man. But I picked up Spider-Man, uh, Asterix and Obelix and, um, and Tintin. And all of those were in Greek and I would read them there. And then I came back to the States and was like, well, I need to get more comics. Obviously they're in English. And I, the first one I got that was not uh, in Greek was a reprint of Fantastic Four number one. And that I was already hooked. And then that hooked me even more and uh, I've been reading comics ever since. And I like the spinner rack in the background. You are yeah. fully represented here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you guys also know, but uh, the last Kickstarter, this is my second Kickstarter. The first Kickstarter I ran was to make spinner racks. We, oh, uh, cool. yeah, the classic comic spinner racks. So I did those a couple years ago. And uh, m basically because I couldn't find a spinner rack and I was like, well, mm. how come no one's making these? I was like, well, I mm. guess I'll make them. So yeah. there you go. Awesome, awesome. And actually, you actually you you have a like a more of a history or an additional history with comics. Like you did stuff with cons and whatnot. Yeah, so I started uh, Emerald City Comic Con in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So um, I also yeah I've, I've got like my life has always intertwined with comics in a bunch of different ways. I used to be a retailer. Uh, I I owned a chain of comic book stores here in Seattle. Um, I also ran Emerald City Comic Con. Um, I wrote a New York Times bestselling graphic novel with First Second uh, that was drawn by Nate Powell, who went on to draw March. Mm -hmm. um, I used to be in a nerd rock band called Kirby Crackle. Love and uh, yeah, yeah I've, just, uh, I've just been doing a lot of stuff in comics for essentially my entire life. There you go. You know, and I can kind of relate to that. You know, your your resume is cooler than mine, but like, yes, I, <laughs> comics have always been around in some way, shape, or form. So I totally love that. Yeah. Uh, so speaking of comics, we do this segment every week where we pick out uh, some of the new releases, and we're going to let you guys join in, and you let us know what you're picking up this week at your local comic shop. So let's just hop right into what's at comic shops, and when we come back, we'll also ask you some more questions about your documentary. Thanks. All right. Hallelujah. It is new release Wednesday, right? So let's go around here. Like, uh, you know what? Um, normally I'd start with Ashton, but I'm going to start with Jim this time. Jim, what is your pick this week? What are you looking forward to reading? Uh, so there's two trades I'm looking to pick up. Uh, one is The Delicates by Brenna Thrumler. It's, her, it's from Oni Press. It's her follow-up to Sheets, which was an amazing graphic novel that she wrote and drew. And so this is her follow-up. So Delicates by Oni. And then um, I want to pick up Earth Boy, uh, which is from Dark Horse. And it's uh, written by Paul Tobin and drawn by Ron Chan. And oh, nice. uh, yeah, so those are my my two picks. There's a few more, but th th those will be my highlights. How about that? That's okay. That's all right. I think Ashton's going to cheat too and give us two, actually. Because you have, what do you, what do you got this week, Ashton? <laughs> Um, okay, so the my main pick that I'm looking forward to the most is called Getting It Together. It's from Image Comics. Uh, it does have Cena Grace on it, who you might recall from Iceman at Marvel and some others that you might be familiar with. But it is your like modern romance, dramedy, hot mess. I am beyond excited for this. <laughs> I don't like drama in my own personal life. I love other people's drama. I want to watch from a distance <laughs> as things explode. And that is what this is going to be. So you okay. have like your three main characters. You've got Sam, Jack, and Lauren. You know, Sam and Jack are best friends. And Sam is dating Lauren. And Lauren is Jack's sister. So you got like the best friend dating the sister thing going on. Uh, mm -hmm. But then here comes Lauren, who's going to decide one day, I want an open relationship. And that's going to explode <laughs> the entire thing into just a giant <laughs> mess. And I'm thrilled to see how it pans out. This is a trade, so it collects the first four. So you get a lot of it all at once, and I am super excited for this. Um, also, another trade I need to point out is Undiscovered Country's second trade is out this week. So that mm -hmm. um, that collects the entire Unity Zone story arc, which is their like high-tech AI zone. Like I talked about this a couple weeks ago. They're harvesting the brains of human children to create this massive interwoven hive mind. It's super dope. You guys know I love this, so get that one too. <laughs> I love that. I always love when you have to explain the plot to that. It's just like, wait, what? Right? <laughs> but it's just weird enough that it's like, 
okay, you got my attention. Like, I'm, I'm definitely into it. Uh, right. What about you, Kevin? What is your pick this week? I am going to be uh, close to home and just jump on BPRD Hell on Earth number one. Nice. Uh, if you've read, if you haven't read, if you have read any BPRD, this is a great jumping on point. Uh, it's the beginning of a new story arc, and you know it's the Bureau for Paranormal paranormal research and defense so it's like this now fractured ragtag team trying to deal with the aftermath of the plague of frogs it's very cool uh but this one includes two uh extra stories so it has um a duncan figredo story and he's just a phenomenal artist and i'll just buy everything he did there's also a short story called seattle that was uh commissioned originally for the emerald city comic con by none other than jim demonacos so i'm gonna make sure i, I get that <laughs> awesome awesome well wow, keep it in the family why not i appreciate that i'm sure dark horse appreciates two shout outs this episode so there you go <laughs> you know i actually have a confession to make i um i'm a bad uh hellboy fan like i've seen all the movies i read the first trade um but my favorite mike mignola anything is actually the amazing screw on head like i just i just love how weird and quirky it is and like that was actually my actually that was my second introduction to Mignola. I think before that it was actually uh, uh, his alien book, Salvation, that he did with Dave Gibbons. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to, after this, after a while through this, I'm going to prep for the documentary. I'm going to get me some more Hellboy and I'm going to dive in and I'm going to read BPRD on top of that. So there you go. Um, my pick this week, actually, uh, you know, everybody did uh, everybody did these uh, smaller publishers and I'm going to be the mainstream guy, I guess. Uh, it's Maestro, Warren Pax, number three. Uh, look, I've talked about this before. Um, this is the second miniseries that Peter David is doing uh, that is based on the Future Imperfect uh, storyline that he did back in the 90s. A very classic run, a very fan favorite run. The Hulk is out of control and he's becoming a dictator and we're seeing his rise to dictatorship. Uh, and uh, what Peter David has done because the original Future and Perfect Story, and you just kind of accept that the that uh, Thor has become a I'm sorry Thor sorry the Hulk has become a dictator. Uh, but what he's doing here is he's kind of outlining the reasons for that, and you're basically getting like the rise of this madman. And so we already got him taking out Hercules in the first miniseries, and now it's turning a new corner where he's reintroducing a. Uh, this collection of characters that I think has kind of been lost since the nineties, which is uh, the Pantheon, uh, which is like, yeah, something that he did in his incredible Hulk run back in the day. Me personally, I'm super excited to see these characters come back. And you know what? Peter David just always knows how to spin a great yarn. It's action packed. It's real fun. It has some actually surprisingly funny moments, some dark, funny, dark comedy moments. Um, so definitely check that out. This is the second mini series. And I actually have a feeling it won't be the last. I think there might be some more down the line. So definitely check out Maestro Warren Packs. That's available at your local comic shop uh, this week. All right. So Ashton, I'm going to fork it over to you so you can ask Jim and Kevin about their documentary. So let's dive in and find out a little bit more about Mike Mignola drawing monsters. Yeah, so let's start with actually something kind of basic. Give us the background on your relationship with each other. How did you guys meet? Uh, so, yeah, so Jim and I have known each other for forever. Um, geez, almost 20 years ago, I, it started because uh, I went to his comic book store because he ran a comic book store. And from there, he was branching out and doing conventions, and then I went to his convention. And so I was kind of trucking along doing video games and animation stuff and always kind of trying to tie it back into comics. And he was basically, we're similar in that we're doing all these different things as filmmaking and storytelling and conventions and music, but always tying it back to comics. So, you know, we've just kind of been in each other's orbit that whole time. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. And Jim, uh, what can you tell us about like what the catalyst was for this documentary? Uh, burgers. So, <laughs> so Kevin and I were uh, were grabbing lunch. We were getting burgers, and we're sitting around and we're just chatting about like the different things we had going on and just stuff that we were interested in. And we just got into like a little interesting conversation about how you know we'd seen a few documentaries pop up, but none of them were really uh, focused on the creators, like the people who are actually bringing the the things that have become the staples of pop culture to life. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was, it was a funny conversation because it was like, you know, it'd just be great if someone did like great behind the scenes conversations and documentaries about the creators who ended up doing the things that everyone knows them for, but not the comic books that were actually the things that 
created the pop culture, you know, like phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And so essentially we were like, well, like, why don't we just do it? And that was kind of how our journey into doing this started. So did you guys both start as Mike Manola fans when you jumped into this documentary? A hundred percent. Yeah. I've been, um, the first time I discovered Mike Mignola was reading Fawford and the Gray Mouser uh, back from Epic Comics, which was an imprint of Marvel at the time. Um, and so this was like 1990, uh, let's say 91. And so, it was just a couple of years before he launched Hellboy. And I, and I read Fawford and the Gray Master and was like, wow, I really like this. It was uh, written by Howard Chaikin and it was just a really great book. But I thought the art was so different and interesting and something just I that I hadn't seen before. And so I just kind of kept an eye out on basically like, who's this guy, Mike Mignola? Like, I like his stuff. And then when they had announced the legend line at Dark Horse uh, with uh, Frank Mike Mignola, I was like, oh, this Mike Mignola guy is doing another, you know, another book. So I'm going to check it out. And that was Hellboy. And basically I've been hooked ever since. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. And so, Kevin, in terms of the documentary itself, what can you tell us about the types of the type of people you interviewed for this? Who, who can we expect to see? I know we saw Neil Gaiman in the trailer. Yeah. So the I think one of the biggest surprises for us was not just how many people like Mike's writing and art, but how many people have been affected by him um, as a person and, and their careers have been been like grown and, and benefited from. So, you know, of course, we're going to be talking to Guillermo del Toro. Uh, we spoke with Rebecca Sugar, the creator of Steven Universe, and she gives a lot of credit to Mike to inspiring for a lot of the elements that we see in Steven Universe. Um, of course, many, many of the comic book creators and, um, you know, Hollywood and animation talent that have worked with or been inspired by Mike. So it's, it's, it's a who's who we've been very fortunate in that so many people love Mike and his work that everyone's pretty much just said, yes, you know, depending on availability, pretty much everyone said that they want to be part of this. That's incredible. Uh, so to switch gears a little bit, I want to talk about the Kickstarter. What kind of rewards can folks expect for participating in the Kickstarter? So we have a, uh, we tried to keep it very simple on one hand. We wanted to say, listen, we're making a documentary. So uh, on the low end, if you want to support it, you can uh, grab some postcards. You can grab some um, a T-shirt. You can get a digital download or you can get a Blu-ray. And then after that, we just have bundles to put them together. And then at the end, we also have a, a portfolio set. So we got a lot of artists who'd worked on Hellboy throughout the years to do all new illustrations of Hellboy and are collecting them into like a limited edition um, uh, portfolio set that basically we're limiting to the campaign. So if you don't get it during the campaign, it's not gonna be available afterwards. So we wanted to make something really special for, and so everything on the campaign, except for the Blu-ray basically, is not, none of it will be available after the end of the month. Wow, that's incredible. Oh, so man. Kevin, coming back to you to wrap this up, two things. Um, anything you wanna tell us about the documentary I haven't hit on yet, and then when can we expect it in terms of release date? So, uh, I mean, I, I think if you're if you're into Mike Mignola and you're into Hellboy, I think we already have you because this is such a great story um, about Hellboy and the Mignola verse and, and Mike's art. But I think this is also just a really compelling story about someone who had a vision and had a voice and decided to do, to risk a lot and go out on their own and create their own world and their own story. So, like, if, if you're into Hellboy, if you're into Mike Mignola, I think you're going to love it. But I think if you just value, like, storytelling and creators and, quite frankly, art, um, I think, like, Mike's story is, is just incredible. And I, I think there's a lot here for people. And to answer the other question, yeah. we're looking, we're, we're going to be filming later in the year. 
uh, we kind of, we, first off, we want to get vaccinated. We want to make sure that people we're talking to are vaccinated and everyone is feeling safe and comfortable because a lot of the, I mean, all the filming essentially we've done has been inside of either people's homes or offices or what. And so if you're going to have a couple of people or, you know, a small crew come in, you want to feel safe. So we're looking to film over, uh, the fall and into the winter and finish it off, uh, by the, the, early, early 2022. That's exciting. We'll have to keep an eye out. Awesome. Awesome. And like, I want to say spoiler alert, uh, Johnny had the uh, URL, the uh, actual Kickstarter up up on screen earlier. You guys have blown past your funding goal at this point, but there's no reason not to support this because look, I, you know, filmmaking, I'm sure, especially documentary filmmaking creates all sorts of unsuspected, unexpected surprises. So definitely show your support. There it is again. Yeah, you guys are 392,000 right now, which is Crazy. awesome. And like, yeah, so I want to I want to say it's a preemptive congratulations, but it kind of isn't at this point, but it's also really cool that you guys were able to to make this happen. And to your point, like, you know, there aren't you know, I didn't even think about that until you said this, Jim, but there aren't really a lot of documentaries about just the creator. It's always about the characters or the company, but to focus on the creator and like and like uh, Kevin said, highlight the art is like I think really important and like we don't see nearly enough of that cuz those guys are They're superstars too. You know what I mean? And like they deserve to be treated like superstars. So awesome. Thank you very much for joining us for this one. Um, So real quick, uh, we didn't do What's at Comic Shops, our video that we do every week with Anamia. So we're going to show you some of the other cool stuff that's dropping this week. And then when we come back, we're going to do a little bit of news. All right, let's do it. Hey, Previews World. Every week we give you the rundown of some of the books hitting the shelves for the first time. Here's What's at Comic Shops for the week of March 24th, 2021. Is that it? No way. Your comic shop has something for every type of customer. So stop at a comic shop today and I'll see you back here next week. And me is not lying. There's so many comics coming out this week and every week. So definitely go to previsworld.com slash new releases to keep updated so that you don't miss an issue uh, because your local comic shop is uh, the place to go to. And like, they're going to carry a lot of this stuff. So definitely support them and uh, keep up to date on everything that's dropping. Uh, let's do a little bit of news real quick. Uh, so this past week, uh, Berserker got a Netflix deal. And like, uh, you know, and I mean, look, I don't think this surprises anybody. Let's be very honest about this. I think that uh, this is pretty obvious, but I'm reading this straight from previousworld.com. Uh, Netflix has re- acquired the rights to the Boom Studios comic book, Berserker, and will first adapt the story into a feature film followed by an anime spinoff series, which I'm excited about. The anime series will further expand the Berserker universe by exploring different elements of the story. In the series, Reeves will reprise his role and voice his character. Uh, Berserker originated, for those of you who aren't familiar, from an original idea idea Reese had been developing for a number of years. It's a brutally epic saga about an immortal warrior, 80,000 80, years old, who fights through the ages. The man known as B is half mortal and half god, cursed and compelled to violence, even at the sacrifice of his sanity. Uh, so this is a 12-issue limited series published by Boom Studios, with the first issue having launched on March 3rd, uh, and the inaugural issue has already sold over 615,000 copies copies, making it the highest selling launch in almost 30 years. So there's already a built in audience for it. So this is kind of like a no brainer for Netflix, right? Um, and yeah, just, uh, you know, shout out to Boom Studios for making that move and making that happen. Um, of course, you know, we, Ash and I were joking earlier this week, uh, it's only been one issue. How are you going to option it? Right. Well, you get Keanu Reeves involved. That's how you. That's how that happened. Yeah, I like that. That write up was like it'll expand the universe, and I'm like, what universe? <laughs> well, you know, in all fairness, this is not that abnormal. Like, I know that uh, Wanted. I remember when Wanted first came out, uh, and actually it was very late. And in between uh, issue one and two, it had already been optioned for a movie. <laughs> and I also remember. Um, 
there was this uh oh god uh uh uh, Ali- uh cowboys versus aliens uh there was a, that was a movie that like i don't even think the tr- the trade paperback had even came out before they made a film for it so but they kept saying it was based on a movie which i kind of think was a little bit of bs so <laughs> or based on a comic book which i think was a little bit of bs but yeah so uh definitely keep an eye on that it's coming to netflix sometime in the future and uh shout out to you know not just keanu reeves but ron garney and uh matt kent for uh you know you know, getting getting involved in this and like seeing seeing the opportunity. Uh, you know, look, Mike Mignola's work has definitely been adapted before. Of course, I mentioned Hellboy earlier. We told, of course, Hellboy. Uh, I mentioned Amazing Screw on Head. There's been Hellboy animated movies and whatnot. And I was curious to uh, like find out in the documentary, do we get any insight into some of those films? And uh, do you guys tackle any of that stuff while you're in your documentary? Yeah, the short answer is yes. Um, Telling Mike's story without talking about the movies would feel incomplete. But mm. once again, our our whole goal was to say, listen, I mean, even though we're talking to Guillermo del Toro, who directed the first couple of movies, we're talking to him more so about who Mike is as an artist, why he's so influential. I mean, um, even like even before he made the movies, Guillermo del Toro has been quoted as saying that he feels that Mike Mignola is one of the most important creators since Jack Kirby and being able to have those kind of conversations, but you're right. Like the, the other part of it is, all right, well, let's talk about these adaptations and what they were and and how they came to be. And so it's a, it's a balance to make sure that we're telling the story of Mike without just being like, Hey, how cool is it that they made a movie of your stuff? You know, like, (laughs) and that's, that's not the story we're telling. All right, right. I mean, you can get that. You can get that interview question anywhere. I'm sure. Like, so yeah, I totally understand that. I actually you know it's funny. Uh, I just um, as, like the conversation of Blade Two of all things came up not too long ago, and uh, it actually reminded me of how visually that movie is very much a Mike Mignola drawing. Like every other scene kind of feels that way. The way it's composed, the way the shadows are utilized, and that's Guillermo del Toro. So there's, that's not a lie. Like he definitely has been influenced by him and like you can see it even in his earlier work. So that's really cool. He, he um, actually says in the uh, director's commentary, he's like, what I'm really going for here is a Mike Mignola moment. And there's a scene where the vampire king comes out of the blood yep. and it's just mm-hmm. in silhouette. And he's like, I'm just, I want to make Mike Mignola comics brought to life. And that yeah. was before the Hellboy movies. That was just when yeah. he was talking about him in abstract. And I, I love that. No, absolutely. Yeah, I definitely remember that too. So yeah, I just always thought that was really cool because you don't normally, you know, I guess normally like you get a director and they're adapting a comic and like they kind of just grab it and kind of run with it. You know what I mean? But for him to even give a nod to a comic book artist is like kind of like a big deal. So really cool. Uh, so this week, actually, in, in addition to all the new comic books that are dropping at your local comic shop, uh, there's a new previews catalog out this week as well. So we're going to give you guys a little look inside what's available to pre-order now at your local comic shop. And when we come back, we'll talk about some of the Hellboy and Mike Mignola items that are available. Check it out. Welcome back, Previews World. Gretchen here with April's Previews Catalog. And not only is it Manga Month, but there's 500 plus pages of must-haves inside previews. On our front cover this month, the next chapter in 2021's Netflix global phenomenon begins. Mark Miller returns to Jupiter's legacy. And with him is artist Tommy Lee Edwards. Miller World presents Jupiter's Legacy Requiem, arriving in comic shops June 16th and available to pre-order now. On the flip cover, the galaxy's most feared bounty hunters are gunning for Boba Fett and his cargo, the frozen body of Han Solo. It's Charles Soule and Steve McNiven's new Star Wars miniseries for Marvel Comics, Star Wars War of the Bounty Hunters, issue number one. For 30 years, Todd McFarlane has focused on a single book for Image Comics, the Guinness record-holding Spawn. This summer, Todd McFarlane expands the scope of Spawn's world of supernatural heroes, angels, and demons with Spawn's Universe issue number one. Speaking of which, McFarlane Toys brings fans of the DC Extended Universe brand new figures based on Zack Snyder's Justice League. These 7-inch action figures feature Superman, Batman, Aquaman, The Flash, and Cyborg. Also, Steppenwolf in his new design and Darkseid can be found with the DC Justice League movie 10-inch mega figures. 
Also available to pre-order this month, The World of the High Republic expands this June in Viz Media's Star Wars The Edge of Balance, an original manga that introduces readers to one of the saga's new Jedi Knights. Diamond Select Toys brings Marvel fans a brand new figure from WandaVision. Wearing the costume that debuted in the series, the Marvel Select Scarlet Witch stands 7 inches tall and is ready to cast her chaos magic. But that's far from it, so run to your local comic shop and pick up a copy of April's previews. Or if you can't wait that long, simply punch in previewsworld.com slash catalog and discover what's available to pre-order now. And I'm on previousworld.com slash catalog right now. And there's some items on here right now. I can tell you there's a Hellboy coaster set, a Hellboy enamel pin, a Hellboy magnet four pack, a Hellboy mug. Uh, but the one thing that did catch my attention immediately is actually uh, there's a new series, uh, Tales from the Outerverse, that is done by Christopher Golden and Mike McMillan and uh, Peter Bernting. And it's called Imogen of Wording Way. Uh, it's a one shot. Uh, that you can pre-order now. So definitely, if you're watching this and you're tuning in because you're excited about this Magnola documentary, then you should go to previsworld.com slash catalog and check out this upcoming one-shot series by your favorite creator. Uh, so definitely let your comic shop know that you're looking forward to this and you want to pre-order it now. Uh, Ashton, definitely. you ready for a little social swamp time? I'm always ready for social swamp. All right, let's do this. Let's dive on in. Ashton's going to take over. It's time for social swamp. Okay, and by Social Swamp, we meant top five, where we ask you guys to give us your top five favorite nerd thing. It can be comic books, comic book adapted movies, anything nerd adjacent. Tell us your top five favorite something. So here's what you guys had to say. Derek says uh, in this weird form, uh, I don't know how to pronounce any of these words, you guys, because I'm not a mangarita, so I'm sorry for offending everybody. But here It'll be amusing to hear you try. That that what? first one that first one should be Tenchi Muyo. Yeah, it's okay. actually spelled wrong. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, four is Hack. Three is Full Metal Alchemist. Two is Inuyasha. All right, go. and one is Gundam. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Sim just says top five favorite fandoms. One of the rare people that actually give us the category for their selections. Yeah. Uh, and they've said five Sonic the Hedgehog, four The Simpsons, three every. What is this? Just it's just exactly how it's spelled. S N K. S N K fighting game. Okay. Uh, two every other Capcom fighting game series not mentioned in number one. Number one Street Fighter and anything versus Capcom. This is very. Specific. <laughs> I see a theme. All right, Jackie says superheroes, tabletop RPGs, Disney, Doctor Who, Harry Potter. None of these things seem related. <laughs> uh, Tony says top five moments from Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. Uh, first campfire scene. What does God need with a starship? The second campfire scene. <laughs> Skybot rides through wasteland on a horse. Spock refuses to join Skybot in the shuttle bay. There you go. I love the specificity of that. I was like, this. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like someone, somebody had been waiting to jump on that. They were like, I already have my top five moments from Star Trek, like ready to go. Right. <laughs> so Kevin and Jen, yes. what about you guys? Like, what is your top five? I'll let Kevin go first. Like uh, what top five do you have? That's going to explode the brains of our viewers. Well, so I, I, I struggled with this. Cause I was like, I was going to do scariest Muppets and then I was going to do top <laughs> top Ooh. transformers redesigns and i was like mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to like overdo the mike mignola stuff but mm -hmm. i'm gonna anyway because i really like <laughs> i really like mike mignola stuff so i did uh the top five things that you probably didn't know about mike mignola or that you probably didn't know that he did mm -hmm. so uh so i'll just jump in um yeah. so first up is that he actually helped define rocket raccoon uh so the rocket raccoon that we know today from guardians of the galaxy probably wouldn't exist without Mike jumping on the book, being the first artist who drew the regular series of it and the first ever full comics with, with him in back in 85. Hmm. So I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, he also art directed a Walt Disney animated feature. Um, so this is in 2001, he directed, uh, or he art directed Atlantis, the lost empire. So, hmm. which is a, is an odd, but beautiful film. So if you watch it, 
it feels absolutely like a Disney film, but it also, you can really see all the weird shadows and designs that are uniquely Mignola. And I think that's pretty great. Um, another super nerdy deep cut for me, although I'm sure a lot of people do know this, was that he is responsible for the design of the modern Mr. Freeze. So he redesigned oh. Mr. Freeze for Batman the Animated Series because before that he was just a guy. Mr. Freeze was just a, a dude in, a, in an awkward suit and he made him <laughs> cool and tragic and scary. And that design has since carried forward, not just to the comics, but also to the video games and new movies and, you know, Lego Batman and everything. And I, I love that. Oh, wow. um, the, the other, speaking of Keanu Reeves being in comic books, uh, before there was Berserker, there was Bram Stoker's Dracula. Mm -hmm. So Mike <laughs> drew Keanu and the whole cast uh, in adapting the, the comic book, but also actually worked with Francis Ford Coppola on the movie itself. So I think that's pretty cool. So that's four. Mm -hmm. My last one, Mike Mignola does Hellboy. So <laughs> everyone thinks they know this, but the thing that I've seen over and over again is that a lot of times people create comic book characters, you know, awesome comic book characters like Harley Quinn or Deadpool. But after working on it for a little while, they pass the baton off and, and new writers and new creators take over the character and the other character goes off and does other things. It's like Neil Gaiman told us, comic creators are shooting stars. They work on something for a little bit. Mike has been writing, drawing, and co-authoring or guiding every Hellboy story that's been published for going on 30 years. So, which is just absolutely unique. You know, there's always a Hellboy presence in the comic book store and not a single thing there that's not guided or touched by Mike. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. That's pretty exceptional. So that's my list. All right, awesome, awesome. I actually did not know that Mr. Freeze thing. Like, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, neither did I. What about you, Jim? What's your top five? Okay, so I thought I'd do something really weird. Uh, hopefully, that's okay. Is uh, I'm going to give you my top five weirdest Judge Dredd villains. Okay, I'm ready. So, to oh, okay, yeah. I've been reading. I got so my comic book store um, at some point, uh, 2000 AD. They do they do these like complete. Uh, I mean, there's like 30 of them. So I'm incomplete because there's so many uh, Judge Dredd collections. And mm -hmm. at some point, Diamond uh, put them on sale for like $5 each. And so I was like, you know what? I'm going <laughs> to, I'll commit to buying like the first 10. And so I've been like reading through these like really wild old 2000 AD, you know, like Alan Grant. Carlos Escara, and oh. as you're reading it, there's some there's there's some characters in there that I'm like these are just these are just weird. So I thought I'd like do a quick compilation of like the weirdest but more most fun characters, and so uh, bad guys at least. There's a bunch of interesting judges. So yeah. um, so first one is Rico Dread because I love the name. Uh, Rico is Judge Dread's clone brother who went crazy and tried to kill original Judge Dredd. So oh, excellent. that's, that's awesome. Uh, is, that the, is that the character that Armando, uh, was it Armando Santo or whatever his name is? Played yeah, uh, Armando Sante played yeah. Rico Dredd. Yeah, yeah, but not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They should have had Sylvester Stallone's brother, you know, like who's kind of yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. let's face it, kind of like a knockoff Sylvester Stallone. Like yeah. as, as Rico Dredd, it would have actually worked out really well. <laughs> it really would have actually. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Yeah. So next up is uh, Don Ugi Apolino, which is a genetically modified ape who became like a 30s gangster. Um, and so he's like a, a monkey that has like a cool like pinstripe hat and suit and uses a Tommy gun to, uh, to cause mayhem. Yep, there it is. Uh, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 pretty, he's pretty dapper, uh, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> Why my, is he in a suit? Like, I have so many questions. I, exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I don't have good answers. I just, like, this. it is what it is. Um, <laughs> my my second favorite part, this is like a uh, subcategory, is that he has two henchmen. One of them uh, is Fast Eek, but the other one is Joe Bananas. And I'm just like, sure, why not? You've got two <laughs> ape sidekicks, and one of them is named Joe Bananas. So Mine's why the hell not? Uh, next up is Call Me Kenneth, which is essentially like a a robot 
who looks kind of like you guys remember Nimrod from the X Men, like the pink oh, robot. Yeah. You know, like he's like this pink robot, and he literally has the words like "Call me Kenneth" like on his chest. <laughs> oh yeah, um, and, and he violates the yeah. There you go, and he violates the robot code and decides to start killing and leads like a machine uprising. So huh. oh, that's there you go. Nightmare. Continue. <laughs> All right, uh, number two is Satanus who, uh, despite his name, is actually like a genetically modified Tyrannosaurus Rex who <laughs> gets extra intelligence and decides to uh, start causing mayhem in, uh, yeah, see, there you go, just mayhem. Uh, and he's literally just like, they're literally like, he's a Tyrannosaurus Rex, but extra aggressive. And I'm like, oh yeah, instead of like, you know, the happy Tyrannosaurus <laughs> Rexes that we normally know, Cool, 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 cool. Um, and then lastly, my favorite is not necessarily, a, it, it's villain adjacent. So I'll explain. Uh, my favorite character is Judge Fish. Um, where, and Brian Ballin did this amazing cover um, of Judge Fish. But what it actually is, is that this, uh, this one guy uh, became a chief judge and he went crazy and he decided to name his goldfish uh after or he sorry he, he decided to name his goldfish the new judge so anytime anything would go bad he's like no nah, the goldfish has said you're guilty and <laughs> yeah. so it's literally just like yeah yeah that cover is like yeah it's just and he's got this little oh, wow. like yeah so those are my <laughs> top five wild judge dread villains what the heck? That wow! Roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no. I want actually. I want to uh, thank you, Jim, for mentioning 2000 AD because I went back and forth about whether or not one of my picks was actually going to be a 2000 AD book this week. And oh, I was going to. Yeah. I'm going to ask Johnny to toss this up real quick. It's not at all what you would expect, uh, Johnny. I sent you a link in the chat if you if you can just like uh, throw it up on screen. But Pat Mills did a book called Sugar Jones apparently back in the day, and yeah. it's just like about this like. The way this guy described as selfish, sour, scheming, forty-year-old gossip columnist. Uh, but it's like it's not at all what you'd expect from 2000 AD. And I mean, maybe, yeah. maybe from Pat Mills, but not really. And I just kind of found it fascinating. So that was actually going to be my pick, just because it was very different. So I love, I love the. Uh, did you ever read any of the martial law stuff that Pat Mills yes. did? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's weirdly what I know him most for. So seeing mm -hmm. this, I'm like, that's wild, right? Right, right, right. Like I've been slowly kind of diving into like European comics, like, you know, like kind of been going from 2000 AD to, to humanoids and everything else I can get my hands on. And like, yeah, I, I'm in the same boat. Like I kind of associate Pat Mills with very specific things and yeah. 2000 AD. And then this came, they dropped this and I was like, I kind of want to read this because God knows what Pat Mills would do with this. Cause he's yeah. quite a character. So, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks guys. I appreciate the top five. Great. As always, this is uh, this is actually probably the best one we've done so far. Cause we really <laughs> went a bunch of different directions, which was awesome. <laughs> Can I ask so, one question before we wrap this up to Kevin? Go for it. Um, what, who, who is the number one ugliest or scariest Muppet? I can't remember which word you used. I just need uh, to know who came in at oh, number one. Oh, oh, I mean, it's gotta be the Chamberlain, the Skeksis. Okay. Um, <laughs> knows, please. Yeah. So yeah, my yeah. my kids, I, I probably showed that my kids that movie when they were too young, and to so <laughs> scare me, they would wake me up and like stand in the hallway and go, please, please, <laughs> and like having wow. a six year old do that is very disconcerting. <laughs> mm -hmm. That totally backfired on you. I was about to say, like, it's a rite of passage to be absolutely terrified by the Dark Crystal because I remember seeing it as a kid and being like, oh, my God, I never want to watch this again. But it turns out that the kids actually took two, which is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ashley, what is this week's poll? What do we got going on here? I'm excited for this one. All right. So this week's poll is designed specifically to whip everybody up. So we, <laughs> as most of them are, uh, we asked you to tell us who won the week between Zack Snyder's Justice League and Falcon and Winter Soldier. So this has three days left. When I checked on it earlier today, it was very close. It was separated by about 5% of the vote. All right, Johnny, let us know Let us know where you fall on this decision. Jump in here and let us know. Oh, see, I was actually going to say that we should leave it up to our guests to decide this one. Okay, all right, well, okay. Actually, like good that. point, good point. Actually, I'm going to follow this up with another question for them. But uh, 
All right. Well, we can, only one of them can vote, so that's not fair. But how okay, about this? Well, uh, then how about this? If they both vote together, then that's the vote. If they both if they both both vote differently, then I'll be the tiebreaker. Okay. All right. Okay. Here we go. All right, okay. Kevin, who won the week? Oh boy. Okay. Well, so I watched both. I enjoyed both. The one that got my family to all watch together and cheer was Falcon and Winter Soldier. All right. Cool. 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 Okay. What about you, Jim? What do you, who who won the week? Uh, so I also, I also watched both. Um, I'm going to go the other direction and, uh, <laughs> and go with <laughs> just to have to make Johnny do the tiebreaker. Um, mm -hmm. but I'm going to go with justice league cause it was super enjoyable. It took us two days to watch it, mind you, but yeah. like, uh, cause that's how long it is. It's about 40 yeah. hours. I don't know if you know. <laughs> um, <40. but> like, <laughs> um, entire week's worth of watching. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But no, uh, we really liked it. it especially I've only ever seen the first justice league once, you know, it's, I'm not, I, I, I can't say I'm a big, like DCU, you know, like, um, fan. Uh, I've, I've seen all the movies at least once. And that one was one that I was like, man, this is kind of a mess. And even though, <laughs> even though the, the one, the, the, the Snyder cut is still kind of bloated in terms of like how long it is, it at yeah, least sure. makes sense. And that's why, I liked it. I mean, I, I enjoyed Falcon and Winter Soldier, but it's hard to compare like episode one of a series, right. which is clearly a setup episode. There's so much stuff in there and I really enjoyed it. And no spoilers, just it set up so many things that are going to obviously pay off throughout the, the series versus again, even though it was long, a pretty cohesive and really, really fun story. So I think I, for this one, I'm going to go with Justice League. All right. Well, Johnny, you got to come in here. You got to break it. You're gonna make me do this, huh? Yeah. All right. I'm. I'm gonna say this, and I. This is what we said yesterday <laughs> on our on our work call, uh, or the production meeting for for the show. Um, I saw the first Justice League when it came out, the Snyder slash Whedon cut, and now watching the new version, it's kind of hard to separate the atrocity that I saw back then. <laughs> From what I'm watching now. And I said this in the call. I said, you know, it's like when you have an ex-girlfriend who just treated you really poorly and you, she comes back into your life and she said that she's sworn that she's changed her ways and she, everything's going to be great. But you just can't forget the terrible things that she's done to you in the past. I just want to hide from this analogy. Like... <laughs> Uh, that being said, I mean, I, I'm, I'm being facetious here. I mean, I, I like the new Justice League movie. I think it was good, but I, I'm... A more of a Marvel person, so my tendency is to like and want to kind of swing it that way. Um, there were things in Justice League I really liked seeing, like Superman in the black outfit, like after he got brought back to life. Like I think that Barry Allen is not as much of a nincompoop in this cut. I still can't get over the way that he runs. <laughs> and that, okay. and I, if you're the Flash and you want to run fast, you want to like kind of like keep your arms together. You don't want to like be like creating wind resistance and then having it look like you're swatting flies. <laughs> so uh -huh. that being said, I'm going for Falcon and Winter Soldier. Okay. And Fifty-four point two percent of people are running that way. Forty-five point eight going for Justice League. But as Ashton said, there are still three days left in this poll, so there are chances for people to swing the vote one way or the other. So. You know, I expected that to lean towards Justice League pretty aggressively, so I'm actually uh, surprised. I'm actually a little happy that uh, there's a, it's a little bit more even. So, you know, well, uh, our our DC fan friends are convinced that the folks that have voted for Marvel in this particular uh, <laughs> there were a lot of not nice things said. I was I'm trying sure. to find a way to like <laughs> present it differently, but like the DC fans are mad and they're like, "Y'all been brainwashed." And I'm like, "Right, okay, yeah, yeah." Know, that that seems. <laughs> Now that seems to be the, the running conversation, I think, is like, yeah, you uh look, I've been called a Marvel zombie my all my life, so whatever, I don't care. <laughs> it's all good. And you know what? If you guys want to find out what I think of Justice League, tune oh in tomorrow, because we're gonna do a round table discussion. Um, I have a few of my few of my buddies on, uh filmmaker Joe Carabeo. We're gonna have uh, Mystical Green Beanie back on who's uh been on the show before. He's and we're also opinionated. He's super opinionated, he definitely <laughs> is. And uh, also we're gonna have Michael Pat sorry, Patrick Michael Strange from uh, New Release Wednesdays. He's going to be joining us as well. So definitely tune in tomorrow. That's going to be at 5 p.m. on this channel. Wherever you're watching it right now, 
that's where it's going to be. So definitely check that out. Um, Ashton, Comic Shop shout out time. What we got going on? This week's Comic Shop shout out goes to Victory Comics in Falls Church, Virginia uh, from Dear Eyes, which is hilarious. Um, If you want us to shout out your local comic shop on the show, find us on social media, tag your shop. If they don't have a handle, just leave their name and also use the hashtag support your LCS. We will find your post. We will shout out your shop on the show and we will give them some love. All right. Perfect. Perfect. And so we are going to close out with that, but real quick, I want uh, Jim and Kevin guys, can you just tell us where we can find you and actually where we can find the uh, Mike McNola documentary? Uh, for me, uh, it's just Jim DeMonacos on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, we also, you can find the documentary on Kickstarter. Just search for either Hellboy or Mike Mignola, and it'll be the first one that comes up because uh, it, since it's a current campaign. There's been other stuff, but uh, easy to find. So hope to, yeah, throw us a follow. Yeah, so, you know, if, if you guys want to see... Jim and I's plan is to just keep telling stories about comic book creators. And so, you know, if if the people that make these comics are exciting and interesting and important to you, you know, come check out our campaign and, uh, and follow up, follow up with us. Awesome. You got seven days to go. Like I said, it's been funded, but you know what? I look, I caught it late and it was already funded when I saw it for the first time. And I support it anyway, because like Kevin said, uh, I'm sorry, like Jim said, like there's not a lot of documentaries that really focus on the creators. And like Kevin said, it's really cool to like, you know, prop up the artists, like, you know, and like, especially if you're a fan of that sort of thing, this is a documentary for you for sure. So definitely check that out. Definitely th- throw support your way. Uh, oh, wait, Johnny's telling me that it was at 385 earlier today. Now it's at 393. So look, there you go. I'm going to, I'm going to take credit you. for that. I'm going to, we're going to take credit for that. That all happened within the hour. I say we take, we take credit. You're for welcome. That, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I just want to remind you guys one more time that Justice League Hangout is tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's not going to be as heated as I wanted it to be because we lost one of our uh, one of our other guests who was like a one of the Snyder Cut. I, you know, I hesitate to say zealots, but like he definitely wears it on his sleeve that he's very proud to be one of the uh, of the Snyder Cut cult, if you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's still going to be a lively and interesting conversation with our guests. Definitely tune in tomorrow. I actually lied and said it's going to be anywhere, but it's actually just going to be on YouTube tomorrow at 5 p.m. So definitely tune in for that. And that's 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, I also want to point out, uh, Anna Mia got a cool interview with the directors of the new Mortal Kombat movie. And that's on our website right now. Head to previewsworld.com and check that out. Uh, she got to see the first 13 minutes of the film itself, which she was raving about and then on top of that she got to ask him a little bit about how culture facts factors into this uh this new film uh and also just like overall the authenticity and just kind of uh maintaining fan expectations for this mortal Kombat movie so definitely check that out that interview is on previewsworld.com right now and last thing as always i want to say like follow subscribe not just me not just Previews World, but definitely like, follow, and subscribe. Uh, free Comic Book Day as well. Definitely uh, follow Jim. <laughs> definitely follow Kevin. And uh, keep up to date on all the comings and goings of the comic world, because that's what we're here to do for you guys. All right? And that's it for Previews World Weekly. I'm one of your hosts, Troy Jeffrey Allen. I'm the other host, Ashton Greenwood. And I'm going to point to Jim on this. Where is he? He's over I'm- here. Why I'm would one of your, just I'm- point directly down, and I would also point directly down? Okay, there you <laughs> go. Here you go. There you go. <laughs> uh, I'm one of your guests, Jim Demonakis. <laughs> and Kevin. And Kevin. All right. And you know, and I'm gonna point to Jim Spinner Rack here because we always close out with this. We'll see you at the Spinner Rack. All right. right <laughs> see you guys later. <laughs>